Happy Wine Wednesday, Canadian wine lovers, Carl's Wine Club members, all of you across the country. Happy International Women's Day. Uh, big day here, a robot. Big day around the world where we are celebrating our, the woman around us, the woman who makes a difference, the woman who, who show us the path to make a difference. And this week, we're going to talk also about the woman in wine, some of the top winemakers, female winemakers that one of we're featuring this week, Kathy Malone at Hillside Estate, because it's Hillside Estate week here at Carl's Wine Club. We are featuring this amazing, one of the pioneer winery on the Nirmada bench uh, here in the Okanagan Valley. So welcome everyone. We are live across the platform and uh, we're excited because we have some great footage to share with you and uh, a lot of things to talk about in terms of wine, what happened over the weekend last week, what's coming up this week and next week. So a lot to chat about. Uh, and I would like to say a little bit of, of uh, in French. Hey, uh, bonjour à tout le monde en français, à toutes nos membres francophones de la belle province, uh, des provinces de l'Atlantique, de l'Ontario, partout où c'est qu'on parle français, à tous nos amateurs de vin francophones. C'est le fun de vous avoir avec nous encore, comme à tous les, les mercredis. Cette semaine, first, um, pr premièrement, on veut souhaiter Une bonne journée internationale de la femme. On, on célèbre euh, les, les femmes qui ont qui ont pavé la voie au, à la nouvelle génération de winemakers, de producteurs de vin. Euh, beaucoup de femmes qui ont qui jouent des rôles prédominants dans l'industrie du vin canadien. Donc euh, euh, bonne bonne journée internationale de la femme à tout le monde. La femme de Carl's Wine Club va se joindre à nous dans quelques minutes. Elle avait un petit, quelques petits trucs à fixer avant qu'on qu se joigne à nous, mais la femme Mira est en, est, est en, est en route pour se joindre à nous. À, à tout le monde en français, c'est la semaine de Hillside Estate Winery, euh, située sur le Naramata Bench, dans la vallée d'Okanagan, dans le centre de l'Okanagan, un des vignobles qui était... Euh, qui a fait partie du, de la fondation de, de, de l'industrie du vin de la Colombie-Britannique depuis 1983. Euh, donc, un, un des pionniers de notre industrie du vin. Donc, un beau bonjour à tout le monde en français. Jean-Denis qui est avec nous, Pierre qui est sur la route. Euh, tous nos amateurs en français, un beau bonjour. Un bon mercredi, c'est le Happy Hour avec Carl's Wine Club. Hey, guess what? We are also live with uh, on the Hillside Estate Facebook page. So we are co-connected today. And uh, so to everyone on the Hillside website, uh, a happy Wine Wednesday with Carl's Wine Club. We're going to chat about your wine, guys, your wines, like a wonderful lineup of wines. Talking about the Moscato Tonnel, um, the Viognier, the brand new 2022 on oak Pinot, uh, Pinot Gris, who was just, just released this week, and an outstanding lineup of red wine, uh, like three Merlots, two single vineyard Merlots, uh, the Heritage uh, Series Merlot as well. And we're talking about the Syrah, the Cabernet Franc. So amazing lineup of wine from Hillside, one of the pioneers of the British Columbia, the Okanagan Valley uh, in the wine, in our wine industry. If we know our industry like it is today, it's because of one of the very powerful women in our wine industry, Vera, so all the way back to Mira the Poca, I think was her name. I think so. I think so. Welcome, Mira. Happy International Women's Day. Yes, thank you. Happy International Women's Day. And I was saying earlier, I was like, it's kind of cool that we're uh, featuring Hillside this week because, uh, you know, all the ladies I know are sending me messages saying, hey, happy Women's Day and all the guys. And, uh, and I'm like, you know, Hillside. Like you said, it got started by a female winemaker back when 
there were even less female winemakers than today back in the 80s i mean she really started in the late 70s i think and um even to this day hillside has a female winemaking lead a winemaker kathy malone you'll meet her in a second we went behind the scenes with her and they have a really awesome um team and with a lot of women on the team so yeah i think feel like the the rest the the wineries are a little bit like the restaurant industry in that there's i think more men at the helm than women uh as far as my winemaking goes right and um yeah so it's really neat to see when there's when there's really talented women on board as well it's awesome there is the team there is a female team here at uh tailside uh kathy is here is the second last on the right kathy malone she's been with she's been with hillside i believe until since uh since 2008 if i'm not mistaken but she is a veteran of the Naramata bench. Uh, she knows the bench inside and out. She's on the, I think she's on the board of the of the Naramata bench winery association. And like I said, like walking the vineyard with Kathy, uh, it's always so much fun, so informative. But she's a wealth of knowledge, no matter what you talk about with Kathy, no matter where you are on the property, it's inside the production facility. It can be in the tasting room. It can be in the vineyard. She has a grasp of every single step of the way. Uh, but and what, I what I really liked about our chat with Kathy, especially this time, is she's been digging into the archives of Hillside, which I think is so cool for someone who has been a winemaker there for so long to really digging dig into the history of the place and uh you know why things were planted where they were planted and why things were made a certain way long ago and stuff like that so i love when there's a soul to an organization and it has that history that people bring forward right and if there's a winery in the okanagan with we're talking about a soul you're talking about background and like behind i, I like to say it behind every every label there's a story waiting to be told right oh yes. the one the, the stories behind the hillside wineries labels are countless there's so many because the way it was founded the story behind how vera arrived in the okanagan and built this, this she was one of the first one of the first five wineries and yeah. so and, Vera yeah. and her husband at the time they came out from eastern europe in the late 60s okay to the okanagan and i believe it was not an easy escape because this was they were coming from the part behind the iron curtain where i grew up too and you could not leave it was not like in canada where you can just get a passport and go somewhere <laughs> Um, I believe so from, they, the, from the Czech, from Czechoslovakia was back then. All now the Republic Czech from Czechoslovakia. From, the Czech, from, yeah. Czechoslovakia. So from there, and of course, people from Eastern Europe. We like our wine, and we reminisce about the vineyards back in the old country. So I'm sure that was a theme for them. They settled in Kelowna. Her husband was a uh, steel worker, I believe, and um, at a certain point, they bought some farmland down near Penticton on the Naramata Bench. And as soon as she saw it, she saw vineyards. It, there were no vineyards there at the time. Now there's like almost 50. But at the time, she's like, this place would be perfect for, for growing wine. And uh, she taught herself winemaking. And she planted the vines with her family. And this was, you know, after about 10 years of hard work, they started making wine. And it was at that point that she met a few other people who were doing the same thing on the bench. And they said, we should be able to sell this stuff. Some of this stuff is really good. And uh, there was no way to legally sell it. Right. Well, because the farm gate winery, the farm, the farm gate license did not exist at that point. You were able to produce one, but you couldn't sell it. The only way you could sell it is to sell it through a restaurant or through the liquor board as the only way. Yeah, so you could, that's funny. Enough that you couldn't sell your own wine. 
Like we think our system is archaic today in 2023 because we have all of these these transborder, like the, the provincial border laws and rules, the stupid regulation and the, the, the pile of regulation between provinces, the federal government and the tax and the excise tax, all of that. But think that think about it in the mid 80s, you couldn't even sell your wine, your own wines at the winery. So oh, they did dinosaur. Have, there were a few wineries that were selling wine in BC at that time. It was mainly hybrid grapes. Mm -hmm. And so not very good. Um at the especially time. At, especially at that time. Yeah, at that especially time. at so that time. Great hybrid grapes today. They figured out how to make them way nicer. But at that time, it was like there was even making wine from like Concord grapes, right? So it was really not. Well, back um, in, back then, Mira, like if you talk to any viticulturist or vid, like there was no vineyard manager, but what people were like the belief of the people from the industry, what you could plant and grow here was the the uh, aromatic German varietals and hybrids. And when I talk about aromatic German varietals, we're talking about Gewurztraminer, uh, Sylvaner, Aaron Felser, um, kind like. By uh, Gewurz, Muscat, all of that, and maybe Rieslings, but that was it. That's the old German like like style. That's why G Geringer brother and Grey Monk uh, started on uh, based on that the foundation and the Arab and the hybrid gray and the hybrid reds, Bacon Noir, and what what like like name it like all of the uh, of the. Uh, Hybrid red, so but Vera didn't like didn't no didn't want to go that route. She didn't no, she was like, No, I can feel it. This place can grow proper vines and grapes and wine. And so she did. She started planting. And there's a fun clip a little later with Kathy who's telling us how she found out that not only they do they have the oldest and probably the first Muscat Autonel vines in Canada, but also the first Gamay vines and the first cab so vines in bc so this and lady that's a very happy. interesting story so yeah. <laughs> yeah so we'll find out a little more about that but yeah so we were driving down the road and then i realized hey we normally take a video when we're driving down the road uh going to a winery just if we're going to show you guys but uh we didn't that time so this is the exact road the exact same time last year at this exact same time Interesting, hey? But there's the road going in from uh, Penticton to Naramata. Then when you get to the winery, there's this gorgeous view. And a little later in the season, you can sit on the patio and have food at their amazing bistro. And of the food is pretty good. And what I'm hearing about the bistro is this year, their chef, who is one of the top chef in BC, is taking it to the next level about the about terroir. He wants to use local, like the local product, but next level. Everything's coming from like the Naramata Bench area, and apparently the new seasonal menu coming up will be off the chart. And I can't wait because I remember last year we were with some members, and uh, was it our anniversary? I believe so. That Br Brent and Andrea yeah. took us out literally well, for anniversary. anniversary. It was their anniversary for sure because oh. they were out here for their anniversary. Oh, I that's true. That's true. Yeah, 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 yeah that, that's true. Uh, <laughs> no, that was Dimitru. That was Dimitru who took us out at the Naramata Inn for our anniversary. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, we you're right. On everybody's anniversaries. <laughs> <laughs> but the Bistro, and we had an outstanding three-course lunch at the Bistro. Uh, yeah, so they season. had last year, like I'm curious what they'll have this year. They have the Bistro lunch, Bistro dinner, and they also have a takeout menu, including things like duck confit tacos and duck and waffles and they had um lamb on the menu and they had uh i think an elk tartare yeah like, yeah i I, I, I had i had the elk tartare last year yeah. they also had some foie gras foie and gras, so yeah. oh yeah 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 um so yeah like top notch i uh, like top gastronomic 
kind of uh, of menu and like the chef is outstanding. So I can't wait to see what he's cooking for this year on the seasonal menu. So uh, really? it will be really interesting. And the view, the view and the setup on the patio at Hillside is pretty special. Yeah. Imagine that cherry tree with leaves on it. <laughs> yeah, and that's funny because if you go back like like just three or four seconds on that video, the vineyard that you see behind the cherry tree, the cherry tree tree, yeah. it it's the uh, how do you call that? I think it's the uh, the experimental section of the uh. of the vineyard. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there, because it's back in the day, I think Vera, Vera has planted a bunch of different uh, grape varietals side by side. So this very block of the vineyard is, right uh, and like, you can find a bunch of different things side by side in uh, <laughs> in couple rows. Uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty interesting. That's where she she first discovered that holy cow, we can grow tons of varietals here not just hybrids right so exactly spot. hey as soon as we got there we ran into this guy who's this guy he just came back. yeah that was, so our friend duncan um so duncan is the president of the winery uh an amazing man a, a connection from calgary very passionate about his, about his role duncan just got back from argentina he went to spend a month traveling uh the argentina wine regions from patagonia to mendoza to Gualtolari. like he went all in uh, Duncan McCowan, uh, he went all in exploring what the Argentinians are doing the best. And like he mentioned, he's like, but thanks God that I'm a carnivore because a month in Argentina, if you're a vegetarian, you will have a very hard time following what the Argentinians are doing because they are so like meat based. But anyway, so he was just back the day before, like we were there on Monday, he arrived late on Sunday night and he was back at the office on Monday morning. The first one to greet us at 9.30 a.m. And he was on it. And that's funny because I was telling him he was so excited about the new on oak, you know, green, the new 2022 yes. release. And he's like, he just got back. He's like, Carl, I think like, we're, we're going to have our new Pinot Gris available very soon. I said, Duncan, we already tasted it. I needed it at 91 points. <laughs> he's like, what? It's ready to go. I say, yeah, you can. <laughs> so he was searching for a bottle of the new Pinot Gris, the on oak Pinot Gris. Fantastic. But this ball okay. has, the, has the potential to be the rock star Pinot Gris of the Okanagan this year. Um, so, so yeah, that was a great chat with Duncan. Remember when we just, just launched Carl's Wine Club and it was right full on COVID. Good friend of mine used to run the, uh, the Marriott, Del the Delta Marriott South Calgary. And we had that, uh, the, uh, how did we call it? The, uh, the great Canadian, uh, the great Canadian, the uh, wine dinner series. Dinner series yeah. And, uh, we had, uh hillside i believe was it the first one or the second one of our dinner at the marriott there and it was a stunning success duncan was there and uh so had, you know, oh, i'll never forget they had these little um shoe pastries yes filled with a prawn salad and like a horseradish creme fraiche on top and it was unbelievably good Which that's what we had with the muscat tonnel that day if i believe so no, the muscat tonnel was paired with the oh, yeah pudding that's chômeur for dessert that's true we I did the, think, the french canadian theme i think the creme fraiche was with the uh pinot gris maybe or that would make sense or the yeah. me one of the other the but yeah yeah it was so good oh my god well, i that, about that pairing the, the whole the, point is, was, we've, we've been partnering up with Hillside for a long time. They've been one of our longest partner in many different things that we've done. And uh, they are such a solid team. And obviously, Kathy Malone is the backbone of, uh, of all of the winemaking team, her experience, her skills. But the way that she extracts 
the sense of place of the Naramata bench, but there's not one grape who comes out, out who comes up outside of the Naramata bench in any of their wine. It's Naramata bench, raising Rome. That's their saying, and that that's that's who they are. They don't produce a wine with grape from Oliver, grapes from the south, or for anywhere. If it's not on the bench. They don't purchase grapes from anywhere else but the bench. They have a good uh, also vineyard holding themselves. They and uh, and Kathy loves to do single vineyard stuff. She can extract the best of some of the best vineyard on the bench below the road, above the road, uh, and she she knows to get the best out of each and every plot of land that she worked with. And she also inherited, inherited of uh, like very, very, she's been not lucky because I don't believe in luck, but what she got from all the gammy vines in the country, all like the only and oldest Moscato Tonnel, uh, like the Cabernet Sauvignon and the, it, like what she got to work with, it's pretty darn spectacular. But what she does, it's to do their, their single vineyard stuff or to blend the best part of each vineyard together to make some really terroir-oriented wines. And this is true in their amount of bench. There's no wine in there or, or like big and heavy and and like high in alcohol without a purpose or without being vintage specific because it's the Narama it's the Narama bench. It's the the lakeside effect where the temperature is never too hot, it's never too cold, and she get the best out of all of that thing. Like her Syrah is it's so also, good. Yes, so good. It's also right in the middle of the Okanagan. So it's not South Okanagan. It's not like far North. It's kind of somewhere in the middle. And so, yeah, you get that kind of like moderating effect. It's pretty sweet. Like it's a really special location. Be careful and, when you say sweet. Oh, it's not sweet. Like as in sugar. <laughs> You're right. Because yeah. Because so, so behind the scenes, nope. These guys at Hillside, they have a tower, which is pretty unique. I've never seen this. Have you seen something like this, Carl? No, it is such a unique construction. Like they wanted to have, when they built that back in the day, they really wanted to, to show, like to be visible. Like you can see it from a while, like from a, like from a far away, it's going to be a tall, like an old school uh, agricultural building. But it came with this it, with its challenge because how do you store regular conventional tank in there? But when you look at when you get where the tower is, oh, you need some tall and skinny. <laughs> here you go. Here they look like <laughs> missiles. They look like mini Nine space rockets. There you go. The world yeah, the world they look like, like they are twenty feet tall. But there's like three or four meter diameter. Like they're really skinny and tall. They're so, more than 20 feet. Like they're very tall. But what's cool is that even though some of them are different capacities, they've raised them all to the same level in the in the top of the tower here. And so that the the winemaker can go on this little bridge in the middle. They call it the catwalk, I think. And then they can actually raise all the tops and do all of the work they need to do at the top there while being able to walk around. It's kind of a really neat concept. Yeah, it is pretty neat. And um, yeah, it's so well isolated. I can't wait for you to show the the, the, the rock the rock wall a little later. Mm -hmm. uh, like, like this construction is fascinating. It's beautiful. There's such a cachet. And Kathy's been working there for a long time, and she made the best usage of all of the, the single, like, square inches available in that place. There's a place where the barrels are located, and you can't, like, there's kind of a, a, a lift. Uh, like a hand lift yeah, to bring like the barrel point. down. Yeah, it's really, really, really cool. And yeah. if you guys, doesn't matter where you are in the country, okay? And if you come to see us this summer or this fall or this spring, we need to take you there. 
We're going to take you to Hillside. First, we're going to have a bite of the bistro because it's so good. But we need to give you a tour of the facility back there. It is so cool. Uh, yeah, to, and this yeah. summer, they're actually like they have a self guided tour up there in this tower. Yeah. You can walk up and down, and they'll have like images from the archives and stuff. It's pretty neat. It's a pretty cool spot to check out. And a lot of people don't know it's there. Like a, we didn't know it was there for a long mm -hmm. time. We've been there so many times and you don't know, but it's a, it's a nice little secret that Carl's wine club members will know. And they'll say, Hey, can we check out the tower? And I don't think you even need an appointment. Like, I think it's a, it's a fairly, um, um for walking through, I think Lauren was saying there's self guided um, tours, but you never know. You might want to check. Uh, out. Uh, yeah, exactly. Hector, oh, my phone is ringing. <laughs> they just say, hey, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so like, Whoa, hold on a second here. Yeah, but I, I'm, but what I mean but is this like is definitely part of the Carl's Wine Club uh, trail, wine trail on the Nermada bench. There's a few wineries that we love, absolutely love working with. And this is always part of our stops. And this is definitely one of them. We like, you know, and, and the beauty to tour the bench is the proximity of each and every winery. They're so close from each other. And uh, there's a few outstanding places where you can eat. And yeah, the bench is probably, if you have to choose one sub-region in the Okanagan, if you had one day, of touring which sub-region would you choose it's a fair question here because there's a couple of really good options yeah. but i think personally i would probably go with the bench yeah and you know what's also cool in the back of the winery just behind where this tower is there's actually a second entrance that most people don't know about and it's and it's got a nice sign out there and everything and i asked what is this there's no road here and she said yeah this is the kettle valley biking trail where they yeah. do iron man every like x number of years so you can bike through the whole naramata bench and make stops at wineries through the secret door at the back so that's kind of cool yeah the bench is known for that cyclist uh the cyclist stops like they even like now i have a winery like right next door to hillside actually where the concept it's like it's on cyclists like like it's all about bikes because the owners are passionate about biking and like yeah chain reaction it's like th there's a lot of uh of people who are touring the bench and bike it's really really cool yeah hey let's hear from kathy for a second she's the winemaker at hillside that we've been chatting about all this time she's awesome and been there for so many years been working with the naramata bench for decades so let's hear from her about these tanks and then we're going to move into the back part outside where they have all the all the other tanks it's kind of cool so, how many liters are these tanks well so it, it, it makes for some interesting shape tanks right you see this it looks like a missile silo right these are um, about four thousand meters yeah so it's a little hard to hear because they were um cleaning some tanks and filtering some stuff but uh well the thing is yeah. they just bottled they just just finished their first run but there's their first run of bottling so that as there's new stuff now ready to go as uh, as new releases so yeah they were in a not only cleaning mode, but they're in rotation right now. So there's a lot going on in there. So here's yeah. we're outside here. Uh, so it was a beautiful. Outside. That was a beautiful day, eh? It beautiful really, really study nice. day. So. Yeah, and we're outside, and Kathy's just explaining a little bit about uh, their tanks because they're outside. Okay, so it does get anywhere from minus twenty to plus forty-four degrees. 
Well, so and also what we're talking about there, we're talking about the 2022 vintage, how slow everything started and what happened here. It pushed everything to harvest so late in the season. But what happened when you hit late, late October, early November? There's frost, there's snows with the tank. If they usually you do the fermentation outside, and what happened when it's minus two, minus three? The ferment, there's no oculate. It doesn't, the, the, the yeast doesn't oculate. So the fermentation does not happen. So you need to warm up the tank to have the fermentation going on. And there's so much heat power that you can use, especially when you produce eight, 9,000 cases like Hillside do. So Kathy was facing, like some years can face some pretty unique challenge. So that's what she's talking about here. Yeah. Can we hear, uh, does she, uh, yeah? <laughs> Yeah, so those are the the tanks, and then. Um, well, and you saw, or you see around the tanks, there, it's uh, that it's, it's insulator, right? But these are like blankets that you can heat or cool off depending on where you're at in the season, depending on what's the the weather outside. So, mm -hmm. and I have to be bad to be careful here what I'm talking about because there's winemakers here listening to us tonight. So Rob yeah, Adams being from so Black Market. Yeah. He's on. I'm pretty sure that Brian Schmidt uh, in Ontario is tuning in now, or he will watch the show. So I really need to make sure that I, my uh, my points are <laughs> are correct. Well, so the great thing is, if you have questions, I'll probably know the answer. Uh, so what we're learning here is that they don't actually have because you'll you'll see there's the tanks inside the stainless steel tanks. We're going to go to a section in a minute where the barrels are, right? So that's where they store their wines, um, as outside here i think is where they um ferment well that's the, we're on the crush pad there so in the so back what we found out is they don't have a press so they are doing whole berry for everything well yeah don't yeah they yeah they yeah they go. right so Let's i thought go. that was super interesting uh there is a um they do have a press. They do have, they do a, have a press. press. They, do, they don't have the steamer. So that's fairly different here. Okay. Yeah. Which we had, however, it's outside, right? And so, you know, we're, we're victims of the elements um, by that time of year. And, and because harvest was so late, like we brought our last grapes in um, the day after the first snow. Right, and it would have been the day up, but we couldn't even get the tractor into the vineyard, right? <laughs> and um, and so, and then it, it turned really, really cold, and so you it know, turned cold so quick. Yeah, and, was... and so I had to really um, budget my heating capacity, right? And so what ended up happening was uh, those, those late reds got really, really, really long cold yeah. soaks. Right, and because I, I needed to put all the heat into the the, um, the extended maceration tanks, right? Yeah. And then one by one, as we had heating capacity, we warm up and ferment and, and you right. Out, you out. Well, well, I mean, no, they were we weren't reusing tanks, but we were reusing heat. Like, like we have a heater that can it can keep two tanks the temperature I want. Right, but you know, if it's minus 20 outside, right? Imagine, imagine, and so I mean, it worked out, and you know, we, we had a couple of reds with 58 still intact, and they're so good, they're fantastic. I know, and, and so, right? Yeah, they're like, yeah, and um, and this, I'm um, like, the seller guys are like. Oh, no, she's gonna want to do this every year now. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, like what's interesting when when people are making wine and really being involved and engaged in the process, like they are. Sometimes these things nature throws at you, even during the winemaking process. They can, they can turn out really, really 
interesting new things in the wines, right? So like she was saying with that cold press that went longer or the cold- um, Cold maceration. Yeah, that went longer than they, they had expected. It actually turned out to be really great for the wine. So that was cool. And well, and it's funny because now like, you know, we're listening to that and now you project in the future and you're like, okay. So I, what, I'm, what I'm hearing here is the 2022 vintage from Hillside, when they're released in 2025 with late 2024, we can expect some big, dark, very concentrated red wine. Um, so, and one of the reasons for it is because it was so cold and the cold maceration, it was the... The fermentation took so long, and they had to alternate with with the the blanket to heat every single tank to get everything started. That uh, like the, the maceration between the juice and the skin lasts for a long time, and it get a lot of color and lots of depth, and there will be lots of complexity into these wines. So yeah, it's exciting. Very exciting, and you know. Um, it was a little loud with the uh, with the part where Kathy was telling about uh, about this part, but you you did ask Carl, how are the vines? And I don't know if you guys saw earlier. I think we had a little clip of the vines. The vines were looking pretty healthy at Hillside, which was great because we've heard horror stories about some wineries that were affected by the cold this last winter and the winter before, where their crops are decimated. Like talking like seventy percent down, right, Carl? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And especially in the both extreme of the valley, northern part of the valley in Kelowna, so Lake Country in Kelowna, and down, all the way down to Oliver Osoyos. Um, so these two extreme of the valley have been pretty affected with the as Oliver Osoyos. I remember when we left for Christmas, we went to uh we went to Victoria. When we drove down there, the day after it was minus twenty-six. It went down to past, I think, minus 27 or 28 in Oliver. They rarely, rarely, rarely see that. And that darn cold sat there for two, two and a half days. So it caused really deep damage to the vines down there. The bench, the bench was, the bench was pretty much not affected at all and uh yeah it's kind of the which we're saying like really the bench would be affected by big fire or extreme cold so cross finger foot uh but yeah. the bench was uh the amount of bench was uh was not that affected uh with the this cold snap in the past winter so that's really really lucky so yeah it's good to hear and she said that um so here we are in front of right there the oldest gamay vines in canada guys right yeah so she's exactly. just telling us they didn't even know this until recently so she's just telling us a little bit about that these are the oldest gamay vines in the country i'm like oh i didn't know in the country oh. and she said yeah because they they bought our grapes one year to make sparkling at uh Bella. At Bella, yeah. And so they, they researched it. They they contacted every Ontario winery and asked them when their vines were planted and determined that these are the oldest gamay. That is pretty cool. Look at the size of the trunk. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I know. So that's, you know, like I... I've heard a lot of my wife here planting cow she planted the muscat, but I've never asked her about the gamay, right? I just assumed it was because she she thought it would um, have a better chance with our shorter season. But it's actually it actually requires um, long, well, long season uh, ripening. Yeah, and like we're just getting we're just getting off a something with Thomas Batchelder. Oh, and he and, said the same. Yeah, and Thomas saying the same. Like people think like oh because yeah we're we the use Right. Oh, it's more like a Bordeaux, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's often the last grape that we pick, actually. Huh. Yeah, I know. It's shocking. And and when were they planted again? 83. 1983. 1983, wow. wow. Yeah, so there's a peasant who lives in this block, or yeah. he lives, I don't know, it's over there somewhere, but you know, like I was driving in the other day just as I was strutting across the road going, I think I might find a couple more little frozen berries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and I know, which I don't mind right now, but it really bugged me during the summer. Yeah. <laughs> I told Chef that that pheasant probably goes really well with him. Yeah, yeah. Look it's into true. It. Yeah. 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 That's how we started to talk about the bistro and all of that conversation was started by by Kathy getting fired off the about the pheasant about the pheasant on the property. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, pretty hilarious. Pretty funny. That was pretty hilarious. I let him, yeah. I loved it. Yeah, she did show us uh, a couple things that were interesting in terms of where the vineyards are. So these are the ones planted in 83, right? interview is what made you plant gamut because she's never told me that right and i found out um this fall because i joined a, a tasting group of just female winemakers Ooh. Okay. awesome yeah oh. <laughs> and when and um is it uh, from the, the from the valley or it's a yeah. bit more national oh just from the valley just, yeah, from, just the valley? from the southern Okanagan really okay because, yeah. oh, that's pretty cool yeah well Aaron organized it yeah so if we see here in the middle i'll see if i can get a better clip of it the bench for those of you that are not familiar with the naramata bench there is something called below the bench below the yeah. road and above the road right so so yeah so below the road the naramata the uh, the naramata bench the main road uh below the road used to be the bottom like the the bottom of the lake because in the last glaciation the lake was uh all the way to the road level so below the road used to be underwater above and the road, the road is like literally the road you see right there sort of the left part of the image there that's the road there's only one road so that's the road yeah exactly <laughs> like the road in front of the building right so yeah. the, the below the road was underwater all the way until the last glaciation so when everything melted the dam burst down after okanagan fall the the uh, the uh the mcintyre bluff and after that well the, the the water level went down so you have above the road and below the road is two completely different soil by having different soil you got m like a very different effect on the grapes depending on the varietals but it gives you a completely different result so they have they they work with especially when we talk about merlot they have four different vineyards that they're working with uh on Merlot and you know, the Dickinson vineyard is a little bit down more closer to the to Nuramata town where it's a young it's younger vines this is uh, so they play with all of that and also do extract single vineyard and that's what makes the portfolio so exciting but we're talking about the hidden valley the hidden valley vineyard who oh, it's like when we were talking uh, and we were walking, so we were walking towards Hidden Valley Vineyard where it's a bowl shape. It, go, it goes all the way down and it's a bowl shape where the, the heat stick down there. It's kind of this own microclimate and it gripes and helped to grow Merlot beautifully. And uh, so we were talking about that. It's always fascinating to learn about these little details. And that's why and I was telling her, like, when I'm tasting Hidden Valley Vineyard, I get a little bit more of that crisp Bordeaux, that dead, that, that tension, and a little bit more old world, that right bang Bordeaux. And it's, what she was explaining is because of the soil composition, uh, just allow to extract that style of wine a little bit more than if you are below the road so yeah so if you hear you're here on the bench you're gonna hear a lot about below the road and above the road so that's always that's right. fun yeah let's hear um let's see if this is the right clip with uh, uh kathy talking about the vid a little bit for oh, so really really good exposure to the lake and um 
really like every year it just blows me away like even the fruit you know it's this beautiful tussies um, flavor that you know every, every year like even in cool years i'm like oh i don't know and then you know i taste it like oh there it is it's, <laughs> yeah yeah it's really nice so it's kind of has both features right because it has that the um, greater complexity in the soil but then it's got that perfect exposure and dickinson is a little younger right yeah, she's talking about the Dickinson Vineyard. And we have a single vineyard Merlot from there in this feature, right? The 2016 vintage, it was a pretty warm year. So it's a richer, like you have two very different style. If we're looking at the Hidden Valley Vineyard and the Dickinson Vineyard, Dickinson is more richer, bolder, uh, fruitier, a little bit more jammy. Okay. If you want to compare new world, old world, it's a little bit more new world style. Very vibrant vines, younger vines, and Hidden Valley have older vines. Uh, and above the road, and it was a little colder vintage, you have more tension, a little bit more snappy tannin. Uh, so very different wines. So it's really, really cool to have the two different vineyards two different vintages too. Um, so yeah, I really, really like these two wines. Both were 92 points. Uh, not only for me, uh, I think the Eden Valley, I gave it a 91 plus and it was Anthony Gismondi who gave it a 92. And surprisingly, because we're known in the industry that uh, Anthony is a pretty hard uh, hard ass when it's time of this when it's come to his points he doesn't give up a high score really rarely and 92 points uh, i'm usually i'm usually a point or two above uh, anthony's rating and uh and yeah now he was he was higher than me on the hidden valley on the hidden valley 2018 and i think that on the dickinson we both give 92 points so we're right on the same page uh, according to our ratings and uh tasting notes so pretty cool to see these wines have been uh nationally acclaimed either here in bc or in ontario wine line i've rated their wines jamie good uh the the doc dr jamie good from the uh, from the uk also rated their wines and we're all on the same page around the 91 to the 93 points uh it's really terroir oriented we're weak we're two weeks we're, we're two feature in a row where we had that exact same thing in ontario with thomas Batchelder where he works with very specific plot of land here we are working with the bench exclusively but really getting the best of each and every uh little plot of vin of vine so really really cool concept and the way that she does it she does it really like in her style this is really the kathy malone style um yes. yes. band. Well, we're getting on now though because right I, I think it was oh five or oh six it was planted okay. Yeah. Oh, we're 15, 15, yeah, so oh, I know okay, I, yeah. I've been talking about it as being a young vineyard for years. <laughs> it's not young yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. That was what was the young vineyard, the Dickinson, right? The it's Dickinson, like Dickinson, yeah, vineyard. because I remember like yeah, but as we were saying, we we're talking about like 10, 12 years old, but yeah, that was 10, 12 years old, four or five years ago. So now yeah. it's more around the five, the fifteen, the fifteen years old. So we're uh, we're talking about uh, not so young anymore, right? That's right. That's right. So I think next we're heading back into the vineyard, or sorry, into the winery um, itself. Yeah. And I love this because they're they're gonna tell us some some uh, fun little stories. This is where the cab soft story comes in after the uh, Moscato Tonel. Hey. Mm -hmm. Can you please change that? <laughs> what? So, <laughs> the thumbnail was all was awful. We were like, <laughs> it means so much to our family at Mira's Eastern yeah, European yeah. And, and all like and all of that. But I really want to enjoy that one yeah. uh, if, from different angles. But for you as a winemaker, is it a troubled child? Is it a uh, something really easy to work with? Mm -hmm. You were the first one. So, I mean, the, the challenge with Muscat is that it's early ripe, I mean, which is 
good thing, but it can be challenging because if we have a very hot summer, um, the acid drops out of it. So the pH starts to go up mm -hmm. and and then it's really susceptible to wasps and you know other kinds of um, damage, right? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you have to pick um, based on the pH. Like it's just like the, the fruit falls apart, which can't you know it can't handle it. Mm -hmm. And so you know cooler summers are actually kind to us. I mean, it's a cool climate, kind of right? Right. And so I was super worried about it the year of the heat dome. 2021, yeah. Yeah, because I've had, I had um, a few years earlier, we had a, a hot spell in the spring, and I had really, really poor set in the muscat. Only, it was the only vine affected, right? And it's because it was early, bud rate was early, and it was during that hot spell, right? And it's not used to heat stress during. Uh, especially flowering. early, it was yeah, flowering. Yeah, exactly. it was especially early in the season. Yeah, and so I was really concerned with the heat dome, but um, it, it made it through okay. And then I wondered if the next year there would be an impact. But no, the lines are strong, and, and you know some of these vines were also planted in '83, right? When I started at Hillside, the the yield was going down every year. But uh, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe you have to pull and replant. And um, but we, we gave them some TLC and um, you know a really good micronutrient program, and um, really brought the vines back and brought the yield back up. And so they're they're, they're pretty healthy. So they're right? still the original vines. Um, yeah, the block was um, extended okay. in 2000. Okay. But okay. yeah, the, the initial block that we were talking to is still there. Still there as part of it. Oh, yeah. that's neat. That's yeah. really cool. Have you heard the story about the calf's off that you planted? No. <laughs> no. So. so, you're on mute. You're on mute. So, this is the story about the calf's off. We were like, what? You have calf's Yeah, this is yeah, this is a pretty cool story. No one had planted capsules in the valley, so uh, as the, at that point, and especially like you know, when we talk about Cabernet Sauvignon in the Okanagan, we uh, right out of the bath, you're thinking Oliver Osoyas. Yeah, right. That's where Cabernet Sauvignon grows should grow and is growing. So, but now. The first vines of Cabernet Sauvignon was right on the bench. Vera's idea. So listen to that. And this, like today, they do make a Cab Sauv. It's just not on the on the hillside estate. It's a Howe Vineyard, I believe, right? Howe Vineyard, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah she planted. So, you know, she got advice when she was planting, right? From, uh, you know, Department of Agriculture people and just, you know, sort of the great growers in the area and that sort of thing. But this was before, was before the that was pullout. Nicole, that was in Nicole's family? It was her? There was not a whole lot of people. Yeah. Lang, I no, think Lang. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and they were growing, well, also, the varieties that they got <laughs> advice about, right? So she was told, you know, hybrids, like, you know, like Germanic white, and so because she's a bit of a <laughs> maverick i guess and apparently a little stubborn <laughs> she um she went really well let's try cabernet sauvignon <laughs> so she planted one row of cab at the end of the whites she had um muscat and pinoloxima at that time right and so years later, we we um, made a cab saw out of the block that's just north of there, the Howe Vineyard. And we, uh, I, I hadn't been using that cab saw in red wine because it was on the same watering regime as the Muscat. Okay. So it was like the greenest, nastiest, most <laughs> bell pepper cab saw you could possibly imagine. And so, um, and I actually had asked our vineyard management group to um, graft it over to Muscat. So it, you know, it doesn't make sense. We just have another girl with Muscat, right? Yeah, so this grafting thing, I just found out about this. 
like what they do is they take the the trunks of the vines and they graft a different varietal on top so you could have the roots of a cab solve with muscat autonel growing at the top kind of wild so that's what she was going to try and do which was really stupid because they were 35 year old vines like the grafts aren't going to take <laughs> and they did 100 percent failure <laughs> not one took right and so um that year we released our first cab solve from the how vineyard and Vera's husband um, came came by, paid us a visit, and I said, "Oh, you take this, a bottle of capsule to Vera. She'll she'll be, you know, interested to have it." And he said, "You know, she planted the first row of capsule in the valley." I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. I used to. Glad those those grass didn't take, right? <laughs> oh, so, yeah. So we so we actually split off the the um, the irrigation so that we can water that one row um, less preferentially. And um, but I still haven't gotten it to the point where I mean it's I don't even think it would make a barrel. Is the problem, yeah. right? But man, that would be cool. Just follow one, up to one barrel out of the oldest cab saw in the valley. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. We, um, there's a friend who just opened a. Yeah, so in the valley. Okay, maybe not in BC. I thought it was in BC. Wow. You mean about the first cab saw? But I think, where else? Where else than in the valley? Like, like I mean, it's yeah, not going to be in the Fraser then. Valley. It's not going to be. It's not going to be in uh, on the yeah. island and the Simon Canyon. The, but the Simon Canyon, they were not doing anything in the eighty in the early eighties. So and Oliver I, of Soyuz, no. I, it's it's in the valley. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Okanagan Valley. Yeah, th that's what she meant. Okay, I get uh, it. Uh, so yeah, probably BC then. <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 that's what she that, that that's what we're talking about right so yeah really unique uh a great portfolio a unique profile and this is just like so cool to walk around with her and having all of these little insight from the early 80s it's just a really really neat and unique for sure for sure so next we went um there's like a bell tower, I think, that you can walk up and down. This thing here, right? Well, that's so, that's the thing was surround the tank, right? So it's next to the tank, right? So yeah. we went all the way down, all the way down. But first, I have to show you guys the view from the top. Okay. Oh, that's where you went when we were looking. We were waiting for you down down below. Like, where is she? Yeah, I took an extra ten seconds, and I got this little clip here. Because it's a pretty cool view. So again, I think that when you're doing the the walking tour of the of the tanks room that we were in earlier, you can also walk down this tower, and it's a gorgeous view. So um, from there, we went down into the barrel room where we found out that they actually have a uh, a new what was that a clay amphora? Yeah, exactly. Exactly, they just purchased a clay amphora, so a really cool little tool that she's starting to play with. Um, actually, right now there's Viognier in there, but there's also a plan yeah, right. for uh, for Sauvignon Blanc uh, coming down the pipe. So yeah, really, really interesting new concept. A uh, new concept. This is one of the oldest way of uh, of aging wines or fermenting wines, but uh, yeah. So the, do you have the clip of that uh, new little tool that she just bought? Yes, I'm just getting it here. Okay. Yeah, so there's the bad boy right there, that clay amphora. So what happens, Carl, with wine when it's aged in clay? Well, it's it's all about like what what's the uh, it's about the surface, right? So this is very small, first and foremost. So the wine does a lot of contact with this, but you don't have any any uh, any oak flavor. Obviously, this is not wood. This it's clay amphora, but it's a very porous 
uh, surface. So it helps aerate the wine, oxygenate the wine when uh, when sitting in there. So and on leaves now. So you and if you have the leaves in there, so what you have, you have a like it just gives you a tremendous texture. So it gives you something in, in uh, stainless steel. You stay like the surface will stay very lean because there's absolutely no aeration, no oxidation at all, no micro oxidation. So your wine stay very pure, very linear, and but also a little leaner. But with amphora, it's a very porous surface. So it helps oxygenate, oxygenate the wine and it gives you tremendous texture. Interesting. That's super interesting because I've tasted wines in concrete and I swear I can tell when they're aged in concrete. There is a different feel to them, a different mouth feel, all that stuff, right? I know I've said that before and Carl, you're like, you're not supposed to taste that, <laughs> but <laughs> is that right? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> but I swear I, I feel a difference. Anyways, so yeah, it's pretty neat that... Uh, <laughs> All right, and then there's the, um, you know what, what's that there? Oh, there you go, this is their bobbing line. This was Kathy's, um, Kathy's best Christmas present ever. You can't the model, right? Whereas, you know, if you don't have it. Because I think if you have a bottling line on site, you get so much more flexibility on when you can bottle, right? Well, that's the thing because there's a few bottling line, mobile bottling line across the valley, and these guys are extremely busy. They're booked year in advance, a year in advance, and they have their run. And as a winery, you have to book the bottling line because don't kid yourself, it's pretty, it's really expensive. It's an extremely expensive tool. So, and also when we talk about space, um, some small wineries. Uh, like they don't have the space to have a bottling line. It's either tank and barrels or a bottling line. So, okay, Hillside are a more established winery. So, and so that gives you exactly the flexibility to bottle whenever you want. Uh, the, the amount of bottle that you want as well, because when you get the truck, the the mobile bottling line. It's hot. like every time you switch wine, you have to empty all the line to clean the whole thing. So you rarely go in and bottle. It's very, very small. If you start bottling, might be, maybe we should, maybe we should wait. Um, we should wait. Uh, a few more weeks before so you can stop and get your stuff and have your stuff sit in barrel for a few more weeks or a few more months or like you know like it, it gives you so much more flexibility to do your thing on your own schedule without being dictated by any outside factor and there's not a ton of wineries in the valley that they have their own bottling lines and uh, hillside or one is one of them so yeah yeah that's pretty awesome stuff and uh yeah that was our visit we ended up going to the tasting room after of course and tasted some wines and uh i think we, we did a little Kathy... vino, a little Enovino demo uh, demo so yeah. but that's funny i'm saying that because marcel just tried to call so i had to stop ah. the phone from ringing so he's trying to call but uh, at this very same moment we we're showing a demo here of the you know vino and she was blown away by the tools so like oh my god this really really work it's not just a gadget so we so, poured the cab solve straight out of weird water. yeah the How Vineyard Capsolve, and then also with the Enovino, which is this wine aerator that you pop into the top of a bottle. And uh, we we just love this wine tool because it in instantly decants the wine, right? And it's, it costs way less than a decanter, and you can put it in a commercial dishwasher, and it doesn't break like a decanter does. Well, like I always said, it's decanting your wine one last of the time, right? Pretty awesome. So and yeah, she really liked the tool. So uh, she liked it enough that I would like that's going to be available at at the hillside over the summer. Yeah. So 
possibly. We'll see. But yeah, the other thing we learned is a little more about the Hillside Wine Club. They're doing a um, sort of um, revamp of some of their materials. But um, the uh, the Hillside Wine Club is one of the biggest wine clubs, I think, in the in the valley. Like there are so many people that support this wine club because they're awesome. They offer you tons of flexibility and they have like points which I thought was brilliant. I don't know how many wineries you guys are part of that have points, but I really like this. So there's different levels. And if you order more wine, you get more points <laughs> and you accumulate the points faster. So I thought this was a great wine club. Um, yeah, mine is one of the most popular and they have the most member. I think they have like 5,000 members or something like crazy oh, I like know. that. I don't know. I have no idea, but they have a lot of members. So yeah, if you're thinking of joining a wine club at a winery, because um, I know a lot of our members have, you know, they, they order wines, discover wines through Curls Wine Club, and we love that. But then they also join the Winery Wine Club and get all the new releases and the special wines that you can't get anywhere else. So Speaking about new releases, we are right into the new release of their uh, on Oak Pinot Gris. Uh, so we are we're in the conjuncture, the con uh, in conjuncture with Carl's Wine Club feature and the, really the, the pre-release of their uh, on Oak Pinot Gris. Every year they sell out before the mid season. Uh, it's a wine that it's like it's just fly off the shelf, and especially this year, Kathy is just so happy with the 2022. I was blown away by the aromatic of this wine, I was blown away by the beautiful texture. And there's a 20, I think it's a 36 hour skin contact there. You can't really see I it think, there. I think but, she said three hours, Carl. <laughs> um, the skin no. contact? No? You think it's 36? I, I swear uh, I heard three. <laughs> okay. But anyway. Uh, okay. And anyway, so you can't see it there, but you have you see a little like uh like a little uh uh pink pinkish who on the wine and it's really really sexy really beautiful color and the wine is refreshing the wine is arom the aromatic it's like walking in an orchard uh right in july so really pleasant wine uh to taste so that's part of their pre-release and also we're talking about their wine club and we had access this time around to their wine club member exclusive cabernet franc uh we asked for it before and it was not possible this time around we had access to uh a few cases of it so it's part of the pack uh a really nice really pure cap franc really authentic cabernet franc uh, that's what we i wrote in my tasting notes right it's like oh my god this is really cap franc it's really nirmata bench really cap franc uh, and like really delicious medium body uh, with everything you can expect from a beautiful Cabernet Franc. So I give it a 91 plus, I believe, or 92 is possible. But anyway, a really beautiful wine and it's wine club member exclusive and we have access to it this time around. So pretty exciting. Yeah, that's so great. What are some of the other wines since we're talking about the wines? Uh, well, the classic, the one that we love is the, is the Moscato Tonnel. And the cool thing is, for me, I tasted probably seven different vintages of Moscato Tonnel from Hillside. And I've been mentioning it since the first time I tasted the 2020. It's it's my favorite vintage of mm -hmm. Moscato Tonnel uh, for multiple reasons. And I gave it a 92 point, but this is the last of the vintage there's no more 2020 they're moving on to the 2021 and uh, so when we talk last year so they reserved the small quantities just for carl's wine club and they're moving on to the 2021 now so this wine has been one of my favorite that's the wine that i would like to take on the road to showcase Canadian that we can do some really cool stuff across the country. And this is one of them, one of the most unique wine. And it's not unique in terms of weird or anything. No, it's just beautiful, balanced, refreshing, uh, slightly off, uh, uh, off dry on the finish, really a slightly, I'm talking about, I think it's eight gram of original sugar, beautiful acid. But there's a florality 
a nice uh, orange nectarine on term of fruit, flower. It's just such a beautiful, pretty wine. Yeah, so, I, I, we got a message from a member that this has become their go-to white wine. And I, I think this is probably one of those wines, Carl, that out of, you know, not that many, like maybe a small handful where members keep reordering by the case. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a great value and it's a it's a just such a likable wine. It's so Yeah, fun. it's a $25 wine, but it's like it's worth every penny. Every time you crack one of these wine open, it's just like bang on, different but not weird, pretty, not in your face, delicate and food friendly. So yeah, I really 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 like that wine. Um, also, we have the three Merlots. So we have the value Merlot, their regular one at $24, where this one is flying off the shelf because it's, uh, especially in BC, when we talk about premium producer, it's rare to be able to find a $24 well-made wine. And this wine got an extra point in my rating because of the value proposition. I love the 19 vintage. It's not overpowering. It's not in your face. There's great structure, right backbone, but that plummy, a little jammy in the finish, really, really well balanced. And the value is like it's fantastic for what you can expect from a premium producer in BC. So this, we have the two, so this is 19 vintage and we have the two single vineyards, Dickinson 16 and Hill and uh, Hidden Valley 18, two very different uh, Merlots from two different plot, plot of land with different perspective. And uh, yeah. That's great. So, and have yeah. you talked about oh, the Syrah? Syrah. The Syrah. The Syrah. <laughs> In that pack, it's like it, it's, yeah, there's so many, like, like there's so many good wines in that pack. Like that Syrah is probably my favorite red of the pack, 92 points. But when I look at like the Pinot Green on Oak Pinot Green, the Muscata Tonnel, with the if you have to ask me to choose a three pack out of that, I'll probably or or a six pack of three wines. I'll do two Syrahs, two Muscat, and two uh, yeah. Pinot, Pinot Gris, maybe. Or like the Cap Franc is really good, but this, that Syrah is really near amount of bench. Uh, medium body. I like like violet flower, but also that blueberry, um, that nice tannin, soft and round already, even for a 19. This wine will last for eight years, easy, uh, and it's a thirty-six dollar wine. I mean, like, how many times now you go around and you find a, they, the, the the good Syrahs are around fifty, fifty-five, sixty dollars. So at thirty-six dollars, it's still a pretty darn good uh, good value. So yeah, awesome. And uh, hey, let's go back to Kathy for one second, because when we were back inside, we asked, we got on the topic of the Naramata bench. And of course, Hillside, one of the things they do is exclusively Naramata, Naramata bench uh, grapes, right? So we asked her what makes the bench so different, like what's so special about it? Solid balance in the fruit. Mm -hmm. It's just the structure. Yeah, and, and it's the, the fruit is very, very sound, right? It's a, a treat to work with. Do you know what I noticed with this one that I don't know that I've noticed before? Maybe it's just because it's not, I'm not usually tasting it on its own. But a real nice floral element as well. Mm -hmm. Like, mm. We're tasting the Viognier there. But yeah, I think that's that kind of sums it up for the Naramata bench is that balance, hey? And I think that that's a common theme in wine, isn't it? <laughs> what are we drinking here, by the way? Cap Franc. Tastings, should I say. This is the Cap Franc? Mm -hmm. That's amazing because Cap Franc is really growing on me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's another medium body, uh, well-defined, 
great structure. And like you just mentioned, it, the structure of the nerve, like that structure, the minerality, and of the the, the neuromata bench. There's nothing overpowering. There's no wines who are too much in your face, high alcohol, all these things. So. Yeah, it's a little bit, it's Cathy style, it's hillside style, they have their very own way of doing thing, and uh, it, that makes them one of the most loved and sought after wines in uh, on the bench and in the valley. Been around forever, they've been one of the pioneers of what we know of our wine industry today. They're, you know, they're, they're quiet. They're discreet. They're not all over the place. I know, like, they're not a huge producer. They're not a micro producer. But they're so great to deal with. They're so easygoing. They're so efficient. They're so pleasant. And everything is good. Just everything is just good. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a great, great winery. So. Here we are. So, yeah. Very excited because there's something else going on in our world this next week, ending on Sunday. And that is the um, Members' Choice Awards. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So, uh, yeah, we're here almost uh, almost at the end of the vote. If you have uh, looked at your social media, you have probably seen uh, all of the posts about it. There's six wineries across the country, three from BC, three from Ontario. We have the email out. We're going to send another email for the last chance to vote. We now have a couple leaders in the clubhouse, uh, but it's a tight race. It's a very, very tight race. Uh, among these uh, amazing wineries, uh, the six of them we have from Ontario, Sioux and staff. A winery from Vineland. We also have Vineland Estate. Well, Suan is born anyway. Uh, Vineland Estate Winery uh, and Mushadri Vineyard. Mushadri is from the Lake Erie, North Shore, Appalachian. These are our three nominees from Ontario. And in BC, we have the Silva Vineyard. Uh, the Silva Vineyards and Winery from the, the Naramata Bench. We have uh, Maverick Estate Winery and Lakeside Maverick from Oliver, um, uh, just past the Golden Miles. And we have Lakeside Cellars, who is in Osoyoos. All of these six partners have done an, an amazing job promoting the whole wine industry, incredible customer service, amazing wine portfolio, and great engagement with the members. So that's why there were our six nominees. And uh, we have a great turn to turn. Uh, uh, like lots of people have voted so far, and uh, it's an exciting time. So we're going to have a winner on Sunday, and I can't wait to uh, to reveal who's winning. Yeah, I'm going to drop the link for the voting in the in the comments in a sec second. And also, before I do that, I'm dropping the link for the hillside feature, because if you haven't had a chance to check out the tasting notes or see the wines and think about whether you want to get some to your house, uh, now is a good time. Now is a good time. Free, like shipping, said, for, free shipping for over $200 purchase. The pack is at $175. You can make some swap and change and add extra bottles, but for $200... Uh, before, uh, after tax, you can get free. You can get to get free shipping if you if you are a VIP plus or VIP unlimited. You sure get free shipping no matter what. So uh, yeah, it's a great week. It's a great week with a great feature, a great winery, a great winemaker, and always fun to feature Hillside Estate Winery. Totally. And now the link for the Members Choice Awards is in the comments. So if you have not voted, please vote. Please share it with your friends. It's public voting right now. So we just want to get as much love to each of these wineries as possible and also pick a winner that we can maybe have a fun Carl's Wine Club members reunion party at. There you go. 
So yeah. that's for it. And uh, yeah, the, the vote is open until what? Until Saturday, right? Or Sunday morning? Sunday at noon Pacific. Sunday at noon. Sunday at noon Pacific. And we announced the winner at 4 Pacific on Sunday. There you go. So uh, fun weekend coming up for Carl's Wine Club. And uh, just a little hint of who we are featuring next in two weeks. Uh, it was one of our nominees last year as, uh, as Carl's Wine Club uh, Winery of the Year, I believe. One of our members' favorite. It was a huge hit the first time a couple of years ago. It's Ice Cellar from uh, Niagara on the Lake with Adnan and Elif Isel. Uh, so that's who we're going to feature in two weeks. So we're talking about big, bold, red wines. Uh, so that's the mojo at Ice Cellar. And uh, it's going to be a real exciting week again in a couple of weeks. So this week we're celebrating in Inside the State from the Naramata Bench. So here we are, and uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks everyone from uh, the Hillside Facebook page for tuning in with us, uh, and hope you enjoy our uh, our behind the scene tour with Kathy Malone at the Hillside. Thanks, Mira. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you, thank you. Happy International Women's Day, everyone, and have a great night. Happy Wine Wednesday. Woo! There you go. Cheers. <laughs>